Day 771 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at the Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 445,000 military personnel losses, including 860 losses in the past day. Then, as for hardware losses, 15 tanks, 73 APVs, and a whopping 50 artillery. And if you think that was a big day, it doesn't even compare to the next thing I'm about to take you to on the map. So we'll head across now and start out in Russia as in the early hours of the day a military airfield in Russia's Rostov Oblast was targeted by a massive wave drone attack. Over 60 explosions lit up the night sky as Russian air defences engaged the incoming UAVs. And in particular, the Morozovsk Air Base, home to well over a dozen Russian jets, was the focus of this such assault. Now, here's the thing. On April 1st, satellite images showed that Russia had 13 Su-34s and 5 Su-35 jets present at the military airbase. Then, just yesterday, it was noted that 18 Su-34s and 3 Su-35s were located at the same base. And since the events of the very early morning, with dozens upon dozens of explosions reported and corresponding footage that speaks to the same so far, it appears there was at least some devastation at the airfield. And even now, Ukrainian intelligence sources are pointing to the occurrence of up to six planes destroyed and up to uh, another eight damaged at the airbase as a result of this massive drone attack. Which, by the way, to have an accumulation of planes of that amount at a single airbase that's less than, I think, 300 kilometers from the front lines of Ukraine, 288 kilometers, it really appears as if Russia is clearly not thinking anywhere near as defensively as they ought to. Now, we wait for visual confirmation on this latest incident, but uh, even already some Russian insider telegrammers have reported something actually happened there at the base. And so the AFU clearly decided on their latest military target of choice and made the decision to overwhelm Russian air defences in the process, as multiple sources suggested there was anywhere between 40 to 60 drones fired at the site. And it must be said that Ukraine is somewhat new to firing medium to long range drones into Russia. So with each and every flurry of drones flown into the country, Ukraine is then working with the growth of an exponential learning curve, making them more effective every time. And clearly that's the case, as Ukraine shouldn't even have been able to get this far into Russian airspace in the first place, let alone striking of multiple strategic assets throughout Russia. And for the wider implications of this event, Ukrainian intelligence sources have emphasized the critical importance of this operation, stating that this event would considerably diminish the combat capabilities of Russian forces, as this airfield houses many jets which Russia deploys and directly really relies on for targeting Ukrainian army positions in frontline locations. Then we'll move across to the eastern Russian frontier as Rostov was not the only location getting targeted by one-way UAVs because overnight the Russian city of Kursk was rocked by the sounds of drone attacks and air defense systems engaging the threats. Russian authorities claimed that electronic warfare systems and air defenses neutralized the drones as per usual. But truly, the incident highlights the growing frequency of drone strikes targeting various regions within Russia's borders simultaneously. It's also believed that there was damage to the airfield at that location as well. And then as for some similar cutting edge or breaking news in Russia, this is really recent news just before starting the recording. It's been stated that at least three Tu-95 strategic strike aircraft of Russia's at the Engels uh, Air Base, there it is, Engels Airfield, were hit alongside two Su-25s. Extremely difficult to verify this stuff on the spot as I'm going into a recording. So what we may indeed be seeing here is a truly concerted effort by the Ukrainian forces to 
strike multiple Russian airfields simultaneously, essentially to clip Russia's wings. But I do expect a lot of information to come out in the upcoming days in regards to all of these latest events. Then moving around on the map and still within Russia as a petrochemical plant in Russia's Stavropol region caught fire earlier today. Several structures including the water circulation towers were damaged in the blaze. The extent of the damage and the cause of the fire are currently unknown, but the timing is suspicious. Emergency services are working to contain the fire in an event to prevent the further destruction at the facility. But hey, it wouldn't be the first time a petrochemical plant inside of Russia was to mysteriously go up in flames. Then finally headed into the Ukrainian map today, into the Donbass, and we'll start out in the Bakhmut axis today, as fighting continues north of Ivaniska towards Shasiv Yar. I'll zoom in right there, as uh, fighting has reached the strategic settlement's outskirts. Although a large number of mechanized, Russian mechanized attacks consisting of over 30 units was repelled. Footage showed how numerous armored vehicles, including tanks, were hit and damaged or destroyed while the rest fled. And since we're here, nearby to this region, Russian propagandist Sladkov proudly presented Solodar over a year after its forceful liberation from Ukraine. As he mentions how the city is so liberated now that you can't even go outside to relieve yourself without risking getting attacked by Ukrainian FPVs. Then headed a bit further south as there was also a great deal of continued combat engagements in Burdichi, uh, which is west of Abdivka. And notably with uh, a Russian BMP-3 that transformed into a moderately sized mushroom cloud after a Ukrainian FPV munition hit. And what I'll do here is add the coordinates in to the map so you can see as it was impressively occurring away from the grey zone behind enemy lines. Then slightly further down south we go as Russian forces were actually pushed back just south of Novelska. So I need to find, there it is, here we go. And I'll just pop that into the, the date map to show you. So yesterday and then moving across to today, just uh, on the south end there. Then somewhere in the east, in fact, we have the coordinates for this one as well. So I'll pop that in. So here we go as... A Russian T-80 BV tank was destroyed south of the village of Krasnohorivka, which is just a little bit north of Marinka. Then moving across on the map to Crimea with a bit of an interesting update as Ukrainian, the Ukrainian partisan group known as Atesh had detected the presence of a Russian Project 21980 special purpose boat, the Grachonok in the southern bay of Sevastopol in occupied Crimea. The vessel, designed to prevent sabotage and special forces infiltration, is believed to be ineffective against Ukrainian naval drones. Atesh also hinted that the boat's chief designer may face questioning regarding the vessel's capabilities, or, or lack thereof. And why am I not surprised? So this development follows recent successful Ukrainian maritime drone attacks against Russian ships, including the sinking of the patrol ship the Sergei Kotov and the amphibious ship the Caesar Kunikov, not to mention many others before that from aerial drones or missiles. Then moving across on the map, because somewhere in the west, for the first time since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, Russian forces have carried out a targeted attack on a solar power plant in Ukraine's rear, as revealed by Ukraine's head of the state grid operator during a press conference yesterday. Now, the exact location of the solar panel plant was not disclosed, but this unprecedented attack on renewable energy facilities raises concerns about Russia's expanding targets within Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Plus, somehow, it just feels like a bit of a dick move as well. I haven't said that in a while. 
Then moving southwest on the map, as Moldovan border guards discovered the remnants of what appears to be a, a Russian Shahed type drone attack near the border with Ukraine. The drone debris was found in the south of the country, approximately 500 meters from the Ukrainian border. The fragments are currently being analyzed by specialists to determine the drone's origin and the circumstances surrounding its crash. This incident follows similar discoveries of Russian drone fragments in both Moldovan and Romanian territories bordering Ukraine's Odessa Oblast in recent months. Then headed very, very north on the map today as the Finnish government has decided to keep its border with Russia closed indefinitely uh, due to the ongoing threats of what it calls instrumentalized migration. Now, Finland initially closed the border in late November 2022 after Russia orchestrated an influx of migrants from various countries as a means of pressuring Helsinki. The Finnish government also closed several maritime crossing points to leisure boating, fearing that Russia may encourage migrants to reach Finland by sea or lakes, which would only seek to endanger lives and strain sea rescue resources. And I take to mean their wording of instrumentalized migration as pretty much weaponized migration. Then headed across to some news for today. So according to a report by Build, Ukraine is set to gain the capability to strike targets in Russia's Ural and Zapolyara regions with drones capable of traveling over 2,500 kilometers within this year. And it's anticipated that by year's end, Ukraine will be equipped by 10 different producers with drones that have that reach of up to 2,500 kilometers. With a rare few expected to go even somewhat beyond that figure. And all of this is strategically significant because areas like the Zapalyara region, which I've just moved away from, uh, otherwise known as, for instance, the, the Murmansk Oblast, is where Russia keeps most of their long-range strike aircraft, like that of the Tu-95 that we just saw at the Engels Air Base, possibly a few destroyed there as well. And so my bet would be that Russia if they act anything like the way their military is acting right now, is that they will likely take a very reactive approach to any events occurring later on after Ukraine receives or gets this drone capability, this really long-range uh, capability there, as Russia seems to wait until a disaster happens, then makes plans based off devastating circumstances. Then in some other hardware news updates, Germany will call on all allies worldwide to provide air defense for Ukraine, as Germany's foreign minister, Baerbock, made the pledge after a NATO-Ukraine council meeting. And this announcement comes about a day after Ukrainian foreign minister, Kuliba, urged allies to provide Ukraine with Patriot air defense systems, as Kuliba noted that Ukraine is the only country currently defending against missile attacks. And he's not wrong. And with nearly a thousand Patriot batteries spread across the world, Ukraine only needs a total of 10, as specified by Zelensky, as he very quickly became very confident of their capabilities about a month or two ago. As of the moment, Ukraine already has three, but is suspected to already have a number of additional Patriot launchers as part of each of their Patriot batteries. Then moving across to some Russian economy news. So Russian oil refineries face repair challenges due to Western sanctions and Ukrainian drone strikes. As per a Reuters report, so far Ukraine has struck 17 Russian oil refineries up to the month of April, but the problems don't just lie there. As for example, a key unit at Look Oil's Norsi plant stopped working after a US firm withdrew, leaving no expertise for repairs. And as for the attacked locations, well, Russia claims repairs will take just one to two months, but the sheer lack of components and know-how complicates the situation drastically. Plus, I must say, that Ural crude oil that gets extracted from Russia is not going to refine itself, especially since it has a higher density and higher sulfur content compared to light, sweet crude oil like that of Brent or WTI, 
Thus, Ural crude is often called a sour crude, which, has, which involves a great degree more of complexity in the process of refining it. So sanctions, lack of Western technology, and not the least of which the drone sorties, is putting the Russian oil refining industry in a bit of a pickle. And I haven't even mentioned their shale extraction industry for oil, which is practically self-destructing due to the loss of Western tech and know-how also. Then in some other news, so Moldovan, Romanian and American troops commenced joint exercises called the JSET 2024 in Moldova, uh, with just starting earlier this month and continues until April 19th. The drills aim to exchange experience and increase interoperability between the militaries. And in recent times, Moldova has been turning to the West to counter the threat posed by Russia, which occupies Moldovan territory, the so-called Transnistria. All amid the current backdrop of Moldova's concerns that Russia is attempting to continually destabilize their country. And so, during these exercises, soldiers are performing parachute jumps, advanced combat fire, and practice specific field tasks. Then, moving on, as the technical issues are forcing me into this better late than never approach or scenario right now, so I'll quickly finish off with something lighter today. As for this story, in a war torn Ukrainian village, a young boy always run out to greet combat helicopters flying nearby, waving his Ukrainian flag with pride. Then, one fateful day, the pilots landed to meet their tiny fan, bearing gifts for him and his loved ones. See, amid the chaos and destruction, the simple act of kindness brought a glimmer of hope and humanity to the boy's life. Because one would think that these helicopters that are often seen as these fearsome machines of war had then become a symbol of comfort and connection in a world turned upside down. I just like it. So that's it for today, guys. These technical issues are really bugging me. Happens once or twice a year, but it is what it is. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like and comment and subscribe. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.